fate is defined as the development of events beyond a person's control. So in this video, we're going to look at three stories of people who are powerless to their circumstances. I have to warn you. These stories are as frustrating as they are horrifying and tragic. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Music one of the worst things a mother can do is watch her son die. When it happens, it can be like a whirlwind, where an army of people surrounds you, asking you to sign forms, asking questions, offering advice, and pushing you to make decisions that you don't want to make. All you want to do is grieve, but you can't. Was him and Judy's 20-year-old son, William, passed away on May 2nd, 2004. She found herself in that situation. Most of it was just noise, and when there wasn't noise, there was too much silence. But from among all that chaos came a request to use William's organs for transplant. She knew William had wanted this, and he had mentioned it a few times. But honestly, she was surprised they'd even consider him. William had been unemployed and living with her in a small, musty apartment, and he'd spent much of his short adult life in prison or high. She knew he'd been smoking marijuana and suspected he might be using harder substances as well. He wasn't a bad kid, just one who made bad decisions. He wanted to do better. He just didn't get the chance. A week prior to his death on April 28th, she'd taken him to the emergency room because he had a bad headache and kept vomiting uncontrollably. The pain was apparently so bad that he wasn't being himself, and he was acting out and losing his temper, and she desperately wanted to get him some help. He also had a bit of a fever that she wanted the doctors to look at, but tragically, on May 3rd, he suffered a brain hemorrhage and died. Because of his background and because of all the symptoms, they assumed it was caused by an overdose seven days earlier. Between the prison, resits, and regular drug use, Judy had been told that he was at risk of EIV hepatitis, but the once strict donation rules have been loosening as science improved. Organs don't have to be perfect or completely infection-free anymore. They just need to be good enough to do the job. So Judy decided that if she could use her son's death to save other people, she would. They quickly prepped William, flew to an expert to harvest his lungs, liver, kidneys, and sections of his arteries, and then shipped them to Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, where five patients were waiting for transplants. The medical staff assured Judy she'd made the right decision, and the surgical teams in Dallas got ready to give the families waiting on the transplant list the good news. Versus for Joshua, Williams' death was supposed to be a second chance at life. Joshua was just two years old when his parents were told he had progressive kidney failure. By age 11, he'd been diagnosed with a disease that slows down kidney functions and stops them from filtering away. By 18, he'd spent his whole life at swollen feet and ankles, fighting for breath when the other kids found things easy, and sometimes becoming so nauseous that he would have to dry heave, even though he hadn't eaten all day. The transplant was a new lease on life. After the operation and recovery, he graduated from high school and started driving a new truck that, until then, he'd only been fit enough to go out in three times. He'd also want to be a doctor and planned on attending college and becoming an echocardiologist. The future was seemingly incredibly bright. A few weeks after his release from the hospital, though, things began to darken. By early June, headaches that he tried to ignore became unbearable, and he kept breaking out in sweat, followed by bouts of uncontrollable vomiting. Joshua's mother, Jennifer, initially put it down to the usual complications associated with the transplant. But then as her son's health worsened, she began to worry if maybe he'd gotten an infection while in surgery, or maybe it was something worse. Despite all the care taken in matching organs with patients sometimes, the immune system can mistake something new for a threat and attack it. Maybe his body was rejecting the new kidney, so she took Joshua back to Baylor's emergency room where he was placed in intensive care, and weirdly, he wasn't on his own. Joshua and his mother were shocked and more than a little worried that two more patients with William's organs were already there. A woman named Cherie had also received a kidney from William, and like Joshua, she left the hospital feeling like she had a new lease on life. She'd spent a year on dialysis and was relieved to be off it. It was a new freedom, a solution to her problems, and for most of May that year, everything was great. Then on May 20th, she started feeling nauseous and got a bad headache that she just couldn't get rid of just like Joshua. Unfortunately, her symptoms worsened as soon as she was discharged on May 27th, and it became so unbearable that she was admitted back into the hospital on June 1st. Then, another 52-year-old man named Jimmy who'd received William's liver had also been admitted with these same symptoms. But they couldn't all be rejecting Williams' organs, or it had to be something else. Weirdly, too, all three had the exact same symptoms. Once the headaches and vomiting passed, they started to become confused or agitated. Their throats became so sore that the idea of drinking terrified them, making it increasingly hard to sleep at night. Meanwhile, 
The staff at the hospital gave them whatever medication they could to try to make things easier. When all of the three of them were well enough, they talk and make jokes, trying to determine what was going wrong, and actually becoming good friends in the process. Soon though, the illness got past the medication. They hallucinated and became increasingly erratic, with signs of extreme anxiety and paranoia. They also became sensitive to light and sound, and began wandering around aimlessly, and they were even aggressive, sometimes trying to bite the people who came into their rooms. This was also accompanied by drooling nonstop. Then tragically, on June 7th, Jimmy died, following by Shuri on the 9th. At the same time, a man from North Texas who'd been given one of William's arteries during a liver transplant died the same way in another hospital. Their fifth victim, a man who was supposed to be receiving William's lungs, died in surgery. Joshua's mom was also desperate to save her son, but it was just too late. Because he was younger and stronger, Joshua managed to hold out for a couple of weeks. But on June 21st, tragically, he too passed away. Following an autopsy, they found that four of the people given William's organs had contracted rabies. Rabies is a virus that quickly spreads to the brain of the host, and there's a vaccine for it, but there's no cure. So if you contract rabies without being vaccinated, it's a death sentence. Any mammal can get it, but worldwide, dog bites are the most common way of spread. Bats have also been known to transmit, especially in North America. So it was clear that it wasn't William's alleged drug use that had killed him. He'd been bitten while living in his mother's bad infested apartment, and that bite had killed him and five others. The surgeons hadn't tested for it because it just never occurred to them. When William and his mother came in, nobody mentioned a bite. Everything about William's death suggested drugs, not rabies. Later, 29 members of the victim's families, 61 healthcare workers, and nearly a dozen others had to undergo a painful rabies injection and its side effects. In the end, the victim's families blamed the hospital, not Judy. Kind of horrifyingly, too, rabies is so rare and testing for it is so expensive that surgeons aren't expected to warn anybody that a donor organ might be infected, even today. Not all organs are screened for rabies. One of the most important days in a British person's life is their 18th birthday. It's not so much a celebration as it is a coming-of-age ceremony, because it's a day that's finally legal to drink alcohol, and you test how much of it you can manage. It's even common for people to forget what they did on their 18th birthday in Britain. If they're being honest, though, most people actually want to forget because they did some stupid things that day. But Gaby wants to forget for another reason. For her, it was the worst night of her life. Back in 2012, Gaby had ambitions to become an accountant and had started studying for her exams at St. Thomas Academy in Lancaster, England. Not long after, second year began. She and 13 friends got together to plan her 18th birthday. It was another friend's 18th too. So, see, they decided to join forces and go out to dinner. Afterward, they figured they might move from bar to bar, drinking cocktails and seeing where things led. Gaby told her parents what she wanted to do, and although they were worried, they knew she was a sensible girl and had a ride home. When Thursday came around, the two birthday girls and their friends met up in the center of town, and it's set 40. Five, they headed to a wine and bistro bar where they booked a table to kick off the celebrations. They actually spent more time talking than drinking and the night was initially relatively tame. But Gaby was enjoying herself and felt special with all the attention she was getting. Once they'd finished their meal, a party member suggested trying something different for her first legal drink. It's at the beginning of the 2010s, cocktails made from dry ice had become the latest gimmick, and celebrity chefs like Heston Blumenthal, known for creating weird creations with odd ingredients, used it to make desserts like egg and bacon ice cream. At the same time, bars were dropping it into cocktails to create a smoking effect. Dry ice is formed using liquid nitrogen. As a gas, nitrogen is safe, and even 78 of the air we breathe is nitrogen. To make it into a liquid, it needs to be cooled to 320 degrees Fahrenheit, or 196 degrees Celsius. For the dry ice effect, you let the liquid evaporate at room temperature, which it does almost as soon as it meets air, leaving a safe but cold cocktail behind. Another trend of the 2010s was a drink called Jagermeister. This is a strong German liquor made from herbs and spices and has a sharp anise taste. People would have shots of it after finishing a pint of beer or even put a shot glass fit in another drink as a Jagerbaum person, and it was inevitable that both trends would be brought together sooner or later. This new concoction was known as a Nitro Jagermeister. It was one part cold coffee, one part Jagermeister, and then a liquid nitrogen bomb was dropped in the mirror Gabby and the other birthday girl decided that their first legal drink would be one of these exciting new combinations. 
and a friend decided to join them. They watched as the mixologist poured the ingredients into a metal shaker and then shook it violently before pouring the mixture into three glasses. Gaby even remembers how theatrical it was when the server came over with three smoking green-brown cocktails, each topped with a crisp white foam, and how the table went silent as the drinks approached. Gaby wanted to check if drinking it was safe while some of the gas was still coming out, so she called the waiter back and he told her it was fine. Liquid nitrogen could be dangerous, but it should have all evaporated. She then sipped her cocktail and was a little disappointed. She wasn't a fan of aniseed, and the aniseed coffee mixture didn't do much for her. But it was her first legal alcoholic drink, and she was out to have some fun. So she went with the gimmick. The waiter seemed to spot Gaby's disappointment and wanted to make it up to her, and offered her another one on the house. She hesitated and then looked around at the faces of her expectant friends and politely accepted the offer. As when it arrived, she took a swig from it, and straight away, her stomach felt weird. She told the waiter, and he told her not to worry, and that the cocktail could make you a bit gassy. Unfortunately, he was wrong. Her, her second drink still contained a little bit of liquid nitrogen, which can burn through almost anything. Right away, she started to feel sick, and she could feel a burning sensation in the pit of her stomach as it began to expand outward. And before long, she was doubled over in pain. When her friends asked what was wrong, she couldn't even talk. All she could do was scream in agony as the liquid nitrogen started to eat away at her stomach lining. Gabby was terrified, and her friends began to panic, and one of them grabbed her and dragged her towards the car, insisting that she drive Gabby to the hospital, rather than wait for an ambulance. She was then immediately taken to surgery to repair the hole. The procedure lasted for four hours, and horrifyingly, they discovered that the liquid nitrogen hadn't just torn a hole in her stomach. Her entire stomach lining had been destroyed. All they could do to save her was remove her stomach completely and then take the tube responsible for getting food from the mouth to her bowels, the esophagus, and fasten it directly onto her bowels. Gaby's parents rushed to her bedside and were with her in the morning as soon as they could after surgery. Her psychometer had held her hand as she faded in and out of consciousness and listened to the doctors as they explained what they'd done to keep her alive. It was the first time they'd removed a stomach on a non-cancer patient. When Gabby woke up, they explained it all to her, but she couldn't grasp what it all meant. She then spent five days in intensive care and another three weeks afterward in recovery. And in that time, the point where her esophagus was joined to her bowels, formed into a small pouch that allowed her to digest food. The surgeons were worried for a while that their operation might not have worked and that they might have to go back in. But thankfully, they did their job well and further scans showed no leakage or any problems. Tragically though, Gabby will never feel hungry again, or enjoy her food like before. Because of her condition, she can only eat bland liquid meals that she forces down because she has to. She also has to have daily vitamin injections because without a stomach, it's hard to get essential nutrients into her system. Incredibly though, it could have been worse. Initially, her doctors thought that she might have to be fed by a tube for the rest of her life. Understandably, Gabby was angry, and it didn't take long before the wine bar and bistro faced steep fines in a civil suit which incidentally, they never paid. The police then also visited every other bar in Lancaster to warn them about what had happened, and most of them stopped using liquid nitrogen in their cocktails. For some cocktail waiters and exologists still use liquid nitrogen in their creations today, but it's rare to find it used in the drink itself. Albert Stevens had been driving all day when he pulled up outside the University of California Hospital in San Francisco. He'd had a surprisingly pleasant drive down through the hills of his hometown despite how much pain he was in. The scenery actually distracted him a little bit from the agony he'd been experiencing in his stomach, and he was hoping the specialist could finally do something about it. His pain had quickly gone from a slight bother to so severe zero that he couldn't concentrate on anything else. It hurt so bad that it was even aging him. His hair was graying, and he was sure he could see more wrinkles in his face than before. He'd been dropping weight, too. And when the family doctor saw him, he was told that he'd lost over 40 pounds in just a few months. Prior to all of this, and even still, Albert loved to drive. In the 1920s, he'd spent a year driving an old model to cover it in his belongs as he and his wife moved from Ohio to California. Back then, his wife was the sick one, and they were traveling cross-country to a warmer climate to try and help her asthma. And apart from the asthma, it was the best time of his life. And after settling down, he set himself up as a house painter and he was popular and always had work and he became known for his smile and the quality of his work. Unfortunately, he hadn't smiled in quite for some time and he'd been finding it difficult to paint. 
In fact, none of the things he enjoyed were fun anymore. All he could do was think about his stomach pain. Initially, the family doctor suspected that he had a malignant ulcer that had spread to the liver, and he suggested he consult a specialist in the Bay Area. When Albert got to UC San Francisco, he checked in and was sent to see pathologist Dr. James F. Reinhardt. Albert was also worried about the cost, but the hospital assured him that he could bring that down by having his family come to the hospital to replace any blood he might need. They only needed a $30 deposit, or roughly $500 today, and then $5 a day from then on. The pathologist then tested him to find out what was wrong by checking his urine and performing an x-ray. They also asked his son to fill in some forms about the family's medical background. When the results came back, Dr. Reinhardt had to give him the bad news that Albert had stomach cancer and it was aggressive. They could try some surgery, but that wasn't guaranteed. And unfortunately, he was only given six months to live, or even back in 1945. 58 years old was a young age to die. Somehow following this diagnosis, a research doctor named Dr. Joseph Gilbert Hamilton heard about Albert and wanted to offer him a deal. Hamilton was a radiology expert and wanted Albert to become part of a new experiment using radioactive phosphorus for a special study. If Albert agreed, they'd cover all his medical expenses, no matter how long he had to stay in the hospital. Albert signed up right away, hopeful that he might be able to help others if not himself. Turned to nose to Albert though, Dr. Hamilton wasn't just a professor of experimental medicine and radiology at UC San Francisco. Interestingly, he also worked on the Manhattan Project. Just in case you weren't aware, the Manhattan Project was a top-secret research community run by Major General Leslie Groves and physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer. It was based out of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and its main goal was to develop the first atomic bomb. But that wasn't the only research that was going on there. Fairly early in the project, the staff had noticed that some of the materials people were handling were dangerous to their health. Little was known about the effects of radiation back then. Other than that, they knew that it could kill. For several scientists had even died of radiation poisoning over the years, but they didn't know much detail about how small doses affected people. Much of their research used radium, uranium, but a new material was proving more challenging to study. Back in 1941, chemists isolated a byproduct of uranium they called plutonium. It looked like it could be a better fuel for atom bombs than uranium, so they built a reactor to make it on an industrial scale for the Manhattan Project. First in the early days, a lot of people handled plutonium, and they were often surrounded by dust and other radioactive particles they could be breathing in. As a result, the medical team started trying to find out how much someone could accidentally ingest by wiping everyone's noses as they left the facilities. Unfortunately, the readings they were getting were higher than they liked, so the health director insists on implementing a safety plan and asked for more studies into the impact of plutonium on the human body. Unfortunately, the problem is that it's hard to detect plutonium once it's ingested. Most radioactive materials like uranium and radium give off gamma rays that can penetrate solid objects like human cells that makes it easy to measure them once they get outside the body. But plutonium mostly emits alpha particles and they can't get through human tissue. They had to find a way to get plutonium inside people if they had any chance of studying it. So they were sigured. The best way to do this was by injecting a human with a tiny amount of plutonium. Dr. Hamilton had been experimenting with radioactive materials since the 1930s, even long before the Second World War had started. He'd been trying to find ways to use radiation to kill cancer cells. He even tested it on himself at one point, and surprisingly, he eventually died from his prolonged exposure to radiation in 1957. Hamilton was helpful to the Manhattan Project, not only because he was a radiation expert, but also because of his research position at UC San Francisco. So when human trials started, he was the perfect person to select patients. He wanted to use people whose prognosis was that they would die in a year or less. These were people who technically had no hope anyway. And Albert wasn't the first person Hamilton had experimented on. In total, Hamilton injected 